is my presentation for the event. And this is the wrong web browser window. So this is the book. It's titled Eight Steps to Better Security, A Simple Cyber Resilience Guide for Business. I need to take a sip of my beverage. My mouth gets dry. If you're constantly talking, your mouth will get dry. So, so I wrote this. It's published by Wiley Tech. And this book is great for two types of people. Um, the primary audience that I wrote this book for is completely non-technical business people because the cyber threat landscape is constantly evolving and all businesses, regardless of how small or how large they are or which industry they're in or where in the world they're in, all businesses need to prepare for cybersecurity and security hardening. And I'm just going to double check and make sure that my mic is on. Yeah. Can I'm going to go to Twitch. Can everyone hear me? Everyone um, on Twitch, can you hear me? Okay, no one's saying that they can't hear me, so I'm going to assume that you can hear me. So I'm going to, so one audience at this, great, thank you, folks. And Flying Kata says, my phone hears you. And, and Kat says, we hear you. Okay. Because that little technical problem we had at the beginning was a little embarrassing, but we got audio working now. So that's good. Thank you so much for your help, Chloe. Thank you. So let's discuss my book. My book is good for non-technical business people to learn how to get started to improve the cybersecurity of their business regardless of its size, regardless of its industry, regardless of where in the world they are. And then the other audience that might find my book useful are people in the cybersecurity field who just want general cybersecurity hardening advice for businesses. This book should be approachable to completely non-technical people, but I offer a lot of great tips and I also get into some personal stuff because there is no one in this industry who can make a book about cybersecurity personal the way I can. This is my own purchased ebook copy via Google Play. Uh, the ebook is available on Google Play. If you prefer Amazon Kindle, it's available there too. I'm pretty sure it's available via Barnes and Noble, via their Nook app. So most places that sell new eBooks, you should be able to buy my book. On October 5th, the paperback will be available. So that will be available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Indigo here in Canada, anywhere basically that sells new books about computer technology, you should be able to buy this book on paperback. And then later this year, it's either later this year or early in 2022, the audiobook will be available. So that will be on Audible, it'll be on audiobooks.com, it'll be everywhere else that you buy audiobooks. So let's uh, get into my book here. So here's the table of contents to give you some idea of what's in my book. So the eight steps are basically eight different areas that you need to be focusing on in order to improve the cybersecurity of your business. So we start by fostering a strong security culture, and then we move on to building a security team, and then regulatory compliance. Regulatory compliance is super important, super important because those fines can really kill a business if they're found to be non-compliant. And then frequent security testing, that encompasses not only penetration testing, but also vulnerability assessments. And I get into the security maturity topic. And then there's security framework application. So there are cybersecurity frameworks that companies can use to design their cyber incident response policies. Controlling your data assets. So data assets are any of your data that's on some sort of storage medium in your local network, in your cloud network, on your endpoints, on your servers, 
on a floppy disk that's in your boss's filing cabinet, anywhere you got data stored. This will show you how to better secure that data. Then we've got understanding the human factor, because believe it or not, the vast majority, not the vast majority, but I would say most, at least like 75% or so of cyber exploits involve social engineering at some point or another. That's deceiving a human being in order to acquire um, unlawful access to data. So that could include uh, phishing attacks, which uses uh, web pages or emails or text messages or social media posts where you pretend to be a trusted organization like a bank or Amazon, your employer or the government, but you're not. You're just pretending to be them in order to get information out of a entity that you're not entitled to have. Autistic people will be really happy that I totally trash ABA in this chapter. I was given a lot, I was given pretty much total creative freedom when I was writing this book. And I really pushed to uh, get some disability activism in my book. So I see parallels between ABA, which is harmful conversion therapy. And we know that conversion therapy is tremendously traumatizing and wrong when it's done for gay people or people who don't conform to uh, outdated and strict uh, gender conformity standards or transgender people. I mean, uh, most people who consider themselves to be progressive can understand that forcing people to be a gender or a gender expression or a sexual orientation that they are not is traumatizing. We need to increase awareness that forcing an autistic person to stop acting autistic is also deeply traumatizing for the same reason. And there's an element of social engineering uh, BS involved in that. So I also diss NFTs because like, NFTs are a total scam. Don't buy NFTs, folks. Uh, so I get into that and UI and UX design and hacktivism so that's the social aspect of cybersecurity. And then we move on to building redundancy and resilience. So that's in your networks. Uh, it involves backing up your data, building capacity and scalability. Business continuity and disaster recovery is very important. You want to know that your business operations can continue when something really terrible happens. Sometimes that's cyber attacks. Sometimes that's natural disasters like floods and hurricanes and stuff like that. Some, you know, so always, always be prepared for really bad stuff to happen. And then in chapter nine, I just kind of recap everything. I recommend books on each of the topics if people want to explore those topics further. And this is the calls. So the business, the busy corporate executive reading my book who wants to remember, what did I just read in this book? This chapter recaps all that and recommends resources for further reading. Uh, I know that there are, yeah, cat, yeah, exactly. I, I don't know if it's appropriate to say that word on the stream, but why not? Fuck ABA. So we have a lot of autistic people watching, so I might as well just show you this part of the book. Oh, yeah. So, oh, I skipped past it. Yikes. We are live, folks. Okay, I'm going to go back to the table of contents. Some of my UI is covered up with the Zoom stuff. There we go. Okay, so first of all, I trash NFTs because basically NFTs, you're just buying, you're not owning something. You're buying a receipt to something that you don't actually own, like a, a graphic on someone's website, for instance. You don't own that, but the NFT is saying, this is you claiming that graphic on someone else's website, but it's not yours. And the person who administrates that web server can get rid of that graphic on their web server. And then that graphic no longer exists at that URL anymore. 
And also it's contributing to the global warming problem, the, the climate change problem. It's bad that the impact of cryptocurrency generation on our rapidly deteriorating climate is bad enough. Adding NFTs to those blockchains is making that problem even worse. So I totally trash NFTs. And then we go on to ABA. So, so yes, I do use my platform in this industry and with major publishers to promote disability rights. So thank you, Wiley, for allowing that to make the final cup of the book. So yeah, the same asshole who invented gay conversion therapy, transgender conversion therapy also invented ABA. And he didn't think any of us were, were people. So a lot of ABA practitioners these days will use their own social engineering techniques and they will say, oh, it's different now. We don't beat children to submission, but rewarding people to act less gay or less autistic is traumatizing as well. You need to let people be their own natural selves. And, you know, if people think it's kind of silly that I'm finding a connection between social engineering attacks and ABA, it's not silly at all. ABA practitioners are given manuals on how to hard sell ABA with parents. They're, you know, they've, they're given manuals on how to sell governments to, to pay for their abusive practices. And those are a lot of the same social manipulation techniques that cyber attackers use. So it takes an autistic person writing about cybersecurity to find the parallels. So that's what I did. So if we can promote the idea that NFTs and ABA are total trash with this book, then I've used my platform to make the world a better place. So I, but I get into a lot of stuff here. I get into like a lot of personal tangents. This is a very personal book, even though it's full of great advice about security hardening. So yeah, there's the introduction chapter. I write in a very conversational style. I always recommend to writers, including on Hack the Box's blog, to write to people as if they are your friend and you're just talking to them about something that you're excited about. I like this paragraph I wrote here. That's what I love to do, take useful information, share it in simple language, and break it down into manageable little bites. This book won't make your brain hurt. You can read one chapter at a time or even just a few pages at a time and glean useful insight that you can use in your everyday lives, as long as working in a business is part of your everyday life. Yeah, I get really personal in this book. And we describe each of the chapters here. There we go. You know what, honestly, uh, the first book that I worked on with, was with Phil Wiley last year, The Pen Tester Blueprint. So it was a, we were both co-authors of that book, but it was based on Phil Wiley's ideas about how to become a pen tester. Great book if you want to get into the industry and learn how to start. But after working with Phil, I was really itching to work on my own book based on my own ideas. So I, I came out of the gate running here. These are my ideas about cybersecurity and a lot of other things that I think are really important. And at some point, I'm going to wander into a bookstore and I'm going to see this book on the shelf and I'm going to have a, a, well, it was also, it was already kind of cool to go to the bookstore, go to the computer section and see the pen tester blueprint on shelves and to also see my entry in Tribe of Hackers. So yeah, seeing yourself, I mean, it's one thing to go on Amazon and to see that Amazon is selling your book, but I was born in the early 1980s. I remember a world before eBooks. And so 
even if the ebook version of this book sells a lot more copies than the paperback, it doesn't really feel real until you got like the physical copy in your hands and you go to an old fashioned bookstore and you see your book on the shelves. That's if I was Gen Z, maybe I would feel differently about that because Gen Z, I think, has never known a world before the internet. I mean, the internet has existed for a long time, like since the early 80s, but since the internet use was common and popular. Um, I remember a world before people didn't have internet access in their homes and they didn't have little mobile computers in their pockets. So, I mean, honestly, honestly, I buy a lot of books in ebook format because one of my favorite ways to read a book is to sit in bed and it's almost bedtime and it's dark in my bedroom and to, you know, just to bury myself under the covers. And ebooks are great for that because the screen is glowing. Uh, your smartphone or tablet is very portable. So that's one way that ebooks are very useful. So I read a lot of books in bed before bedtime. So that's when I typically go for the ebook format. I go for the physical book format when I want to see something physical on my bookshelf. And then a lot of people also find that they really enjoy audiobooks. And I like listening to audiobooks and I like listening to podcasts. And audiobooks, especially if they're a nonfiction audiobook, is just like a really, really, really long podcast. And people like listening to audiobooks in their car or while they're or while they're riding their bicycles or on public transit. I like listening to podcasts and eat and audiobooks, frankly, when I'm in the bathtub. <laughs> I always got I'm ADHD, so I need constant stimulation, right? And audiobooks also make books accessible for blind people. So I'm really happy that it's important to Wiley to release the book in multiple formats. If they ever like release this book in a language other than English, I will be really happy about that too. I don't think I've ever had a book published in any language other than English. So, oh, uh, thank you, Chloe. So we've got, I believe, 25 minutes. Actually, we have 23 minutes. So I'm gonna discuss my book a little more. So we start with fostering a strong security culture. That's really important because culture is something that people do as a group. Culture is the habits that people develop as a group. It's what you do as a group without deliberately thinking about it. Um, everyone's actions within an organization or a business have some impact on your cybersecurity, even the janitor, even the receptionist. All these people are gatekeepers to your company's data. So the first step is always, always to foster a strong security culture, which is something that you do in your everyday actions. As I say, Cybersecurity is as much a human area of study as it is a technological area of study. So that's very important. So you foster a strong security culture, and then you move on to building a strong security team. And this chapter is controversial. Uh, one of the reasons why it's controversial is that you'll hear some people in our industry not people who are actual cybersecurity practitioners, but usually business groups like Cybersecurity Ventures, Steve Morgan. I didn't say that. You didn't hear that. But some people in our industry are propagandizing the idea that there is a cybersecurity skills gap because people in the workplace, people in the, the job market, just don't have these cyber skills that they need. So the problem is the fault of job applicants, or the problem is the fault of these colleges and universities 
that aren't training people to have the right skills that they need. So they can't find people with the right skills and they got to go to industry publications and whine about this while they leave cybersecurity roles empty. And that is why the cybersecurity skills gap, as it is marketed by those people, is a total myth. People need cybersecurity training, which is one of the things that Hack the Box does a really awesome job of doing. And no matter what your role or credentials that you have, you should be a constant learner. You should be constantly upgrading your skills. But that is not the problem. The problem is that these companies are looking for people who don't exist or they are reluctant to train people. They want unicorns. They want people out of the box who have 40 different niche credentials and those people don't exist. And instead of training people to have those niche credentials, they just, oh, we're helpless. Oh, I'm a multi-billion dollar corporation and I'm so helpless. You know how ridiculous that is? Yeah, so I, you know, I also mentioned there's a real barrier to entry. How is a poor person, how is a poor person supposed to enter the cybersecurity industry? Uh, college, university education is enormously expensive. That's a major barrier to entry right there. Um, even if you just go the route of going to CompTIA or Hack the Box or other entities that provide cybersecurity training and credentials, how are they supposed to come up with the money for those training programs? There are some certifications in our industry that cost like several thousand dollars just to write the exam. Like, there's a wide segment of our population who can't afford to do that. It's ridiculous. Companies need to be paying for this training. They can afford that money. Uh, fortunately, Pack the Box has a lot of training that is free of charge or really inexpensive, but some cybersecurity training can be really expensive, and that's a major barrier to entry. That was a barrier to entry to me in the industry for a while. It's really ironic. Now I'm in a position where I can afford to spend several thousand dollars on my own training if I want to. But to get to the position that I'm in where I'm making enough money that I can afford to do that, like it's too late now. I've got, I've got, I've got good paying work. I've got a successful career. Um, I let any of the certs that I used to have expire because I didn't need to do them anymore. I, I'm already, I've already, why, why should you make, Keep up with your certifications if you don't need them in order to maintain your employment. So <clears throat> it's like it's like a catch-22. Now I wasn't able to afford to do much of this on my own until I was already in a position where <laughs> now I'm already now that I can afford to do it, I don't need them anymore. So so I get into that. I try to encourage businesses to pay to train people and to consider for entry level roles, people who have no credentials, but who show promise in some areas. Um, this is a fictional job posting, but it's a very realistic fictional job posting. And we actually see job postings that look just like this. And so we've got specialists, entry level, <clears throat> Reports to the SOC manager must have 10 years of Kubernetes experience, five years of Windows Server 2019 experience, five years Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 experience, a master's degree in, cyber, in computer science or better. This is entry level. Demonstrable ability with the AT&T Cybersecurity Alien Vault Unified Security Management Platform that's a scene, that's a security information and event management technology that people will only have experience with if they've already done work in a security operations center. <laughs> we need a CISSP. Now, CISSPs not only cost thousands of dollars to acquire, you also need to be in the industry for at least five years, like entry level my ass. EC Council, Certified Ethical Hacker, uh, PMI, Project Management Professional, contributed 
to at least one entry in the common vulnerabilities and exposures database. <laughs> oh, look, so we're expecting like basically millions of dollars worth of credentials for an entry level person. Some of these credentials are actually impossible. You can't have 10 years Kubernetes experience. The technology has not existed for that long, uh, nor has Windows Server been around for five years. So Windows Server 2019, I mean. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 wasn't available until late 2018, May 2019. That's an impossible expectation. We see this all the time. See, I, SSPs are really advanced certs that are really, they're appropriate for someone in an executive position, like a chief information security officer. Asking for a CI SSP in an entry level role is basically like asking for a PhD in an entry level role. Like it's it's ridiculous. So I've got your skills gap, folks. It's right here. You're looking for impossible people, and then you're looking to pay people who for millions of dollars worth of credentials, forty grand a year. And I know that there are a lot of people who would love to be paid forty grand a year because you know people are really financially hurting these days but someone with a phd is not going to accept a 40 grand a year job with their phd you would hope like like i make a lot more than that and i don't have any of those credentials so hack the box is doing a lot of great stuff to to counter this problem we're working with employers we're giving people free cybersecurity training and also very affordable cybersecurity training like we have our vip program that costs about 20 bucks a month that's a lot more accessible than thousands of dollars worth of certs um but we have a lot of really archaic expectations that a lot of people in the industry have. I quote Alyssa Miller, who has said a lot of awesome stuff about this topic. So yeah, every time I see the phrase cybersecurity skills gap, um, at, while recognizing that cybersecurity training is very important, I know that these uh, industry leaders are talking bullshit. We need to train we need to a invest in people's training and we need to b offer people training that is affordable and accessible so just going through my book a little more we've got another 13 minutes here until kieran oliver i get into some like really Need, even though this book should be accessible to non-technical people, I introduce some stuff that is really specific to our industry, like the NIST cybersecurity framework is a policy structure that is used in a lot of businesses to design incident response policies. In cybersecurity, incident response is a group of people and it's a responsibility and a role where if there's reason to believe that there is some sort of cyber exploitation going on in your network or your computer systems, your job is to respond to it. Your job is to, depending on the situation, either stop the cyber threat from occurring or mitigate the cyber threat, which means to prevent it from doing more damage. And then incident response will try to fix the problem afterward undo the damage and they'll work with legal specialists and PR specialists to make sure that the cyber incident does minimal damage to their organization. We've got controlling your data assets, very, very important as well. I go into security testing. So when it comes to security testing, a lot of people are familiar with the term pen testing. And that's the main skill that we try to teach at Hack the Box, which penetration testing is basically you get to pretend to be a cyber attacker and you try to see if your client or the company that you work for can be cyber exploited. So, so uh, 
it's a really cool job that a lot of people are really attracted to. I wrote a book about it with Phil Wiley last year, The Pentester Blueprint. Hack the Box is working on providing cybersecurity training in other areas, but we started with pen testing and we specialize in pen testing. It's a growing career field, and I hope people who win um, our VIP Plus membership giveaway find success in their careers. But there are also other kinds of security testing. Not all organizations are ready for pen testing. Uh, you need to have a certain level of security maturity in your organization in order for pen testing to be appropriate. So you need to have the ability to withstand the simulated cyber attacks without destroying your business. So that's one reason why security maturity is important. And then the other reason is you need to be able to do something with the information that the pen testers are giving you in their reports. And if you don't have sufficient security maturity, you're not going to be able to act on the findings very well. And another reason is if you have insufficient security maturity, instead of finding a few problems with your security that you can focus on later on, you're going to find that everything's wrong, everything's broken. There are too many holes, there are too many things to explore. All organizations, regardless of your size, if you've got zero security maturity, if you've got lots of security maturity, can benefit from vulnerability assessments, which is you go through a checklist and you see, is there this wrong, is that wrong? Are we good on this, are we good on that? That's a good kind of security testing that all organizations should be doing Pen testing is for later on when you've got a little bit of security maturity behind your belt. So you've got lots of different ways to find the vulnerabilities in your network so you can make your network and your applications more secure. So, and frequent security testing. So it has to be frequent, it has to be repeated. You don't just do security testing once and forget about it a decade later. It's something that you do every so often. Hopefully a few times a year, it depends on uh, the context of your organization, but yeah, always be testing for security. This is a defensive topic, controlling your data assets is very important. Understanding the human factor, the social element of cyber exploitation is crucial. And then building redundancy and resilience. That's uh, one very important aspect of secure network design is to have redundant servers, redundant bandwidth. Um, it's expensive, it's not appropriate for all organizations, but sometimes being multi-cloud, meaning you don't just have one cloud provider, you don't just have Amazon AWS, you could also have uh, Microsoft Azure as a second cloud provider, you could have Salesforce or Google Cloud Platform as a third cloud provider. So that's another way that you can build redundancy and resilience. If something goes wrong with one of your cloud providers, you've got other ones that are also running your applications and your data. Um, back up your data locally, so in, on your own premises. Just have something, have backups, have extra capacity, have extra servers. So if something bad happens to any particular element of your network, you have backups and you have redundant computers that can step up the plate so you don't lose your services and you don't lose your data. Um, in the security cult, is this the, yeah, in the security culture chapter, I talk about Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick is very famous, infamous, notorious. He's also my colleague in the sense that his books have also been published by Wiley. And uh, He's perhaps the most notorious former cyber criminal in the world. He got a lot of media attention for his cyber exploits in the 1980s and early 1990s. And uh, one thing that a lot of people don't understand about what Kevin Mitnick used to do is it was completely based, I mean, it wasn't completely, but it was mainly social engineering. Most of what Kevin Mitnick did wasn't uh, super complicated technical stuff. It was fooling a human being into getting some information out of them. 
So I go into that a little bit. I go into hacker culture. This is one of my major pet peeves, both as a Hack the Box employee and as a hacker myself, is the word hacker being used to mean bad guys. Hackers are actually the good guys. They are the inventors of new technology. Uh, a lot of the technology we use today was invented by hackers. Uh, Steve Wozniak, you know, co-founder of Apple, was a hacker. Um, Linus Torvalds, the, the guy who started the, the Linux kernel, he was a hacker. A lot of these uh, brilliant tech people, they were hackers and they are hackers. So it's very important in my work because I've spent years writing about cybersecurity and cyber threats to always call them cyber attackers, cyber criminals, cyber threat actors every time. I see Wired Magazine or some other app, some other publication use the word hackers to mean cyber criminal. It just, it pisses me off. So yeah, um, we've got five minutes left in this presentation. Oh, I get into this, the psychological phases of a cybersecurity professional. These are the epiphanies that I had over time over the course of my work in the industry. So, when we start learning about cybersecurity, we often believe that computer software, hardware, and networks can be made 100% secure. I must learn about, about everything that makes computers vulnerable so those things can be completely remedied. And then there will be no more security problems. We learn very quickly that that's a fallacy. Absolutely nothing is 100% secure. Absolutely nothing can be made 100% secure. It's about mitigating risk. It's about deciding where along the usability and security continuum is the best for your organization and always being prepared for new vulnerabilities to be discovered and new cyber threats to occur. I talk about the complexity of applications by comparing them to the difference between NES games and PS4 games. I love video games, folks. I'll, I'll shoehorn a video game reference if I want. Um, then there's the next phase, overconfidence, which is, I'm brilliant. Why are my users so foolish? They do all these foolish things. How can they be so ignorant? My silly users are the security problem. As for me, I'm a cybersecurity expert, so my habits are perfect, and I could never fall for a social engineering attack. I'm too smart for that. Well, no, actually, People like me, and perhaps me personally, can succumb to phishing attacks, to vishing, to other sorts of... Actually, cybersecurity professionals are targeted by phishing more often these days because we have access to a lot of really lucrative information and access to information systems. And also, you know, don't look down on your users. A better security is built when you don't blame the user for a security issue when you design the systems so that they are more secure, so that your users don't have to have computer science PhDs in order for them to use your applications in a secure way. I'm all about punching up and not punching down. Don't blame the entities with less power, blame the entities with more power. It is your job as a company and it's your job as an application developer to improve the security of your applications and your networks. Don't blame the users. So that's a big thing. And you go through those phases and then you finally become a wise cybersecurity professional. One that understands that nothing can be made 100% secure. One that knows that you should always be vigilant about security and one who focuses on designing secure systems rather than blaming end users. So there we go. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Eight Steps to Better Security. The ebook is available now um, on pretty much all major ebook platforms. Uh, the uh, paperback will be coming out on October 5th, pretty much anywhere that you can buy books about computer technology. 
and the audio book will be available in a few months. I know they're working on it. So there you go. So Kieran Oliver is going to be coming up in 10 minutes. And I'm just going to send a message to, to so uh, Chloe, I sent you a message in Zoom. OK, excellent. So Kieran Oliver is ready to present Leveraging Neurodivergence in InfoSec. So I am going to stop my video and mute, and let's watch what Kieran's got to say. Thank you, Chloe. Karen, unmute your mic, please. 